Welcome to Drive It, DWTV's car magazine. Coming up, the Porsche Carrera Cup at the Nürburgring. Sightseeing on a swimming bus. And the new Audi Q3. The Q3 is the latest addition to Audi's line of sport utility vehicles. The body is reminiscent of a coupe, giving this compact SUV a sporty edge. The car's trademarks are cool lines, elegant curves, and a distinctive set of head and tail lights. The car company decided it was time to create a premium compact SUV says Michael Epler from Audi. That was the idea behind the Q3, making it a perfect fit in the Q family. Epler says demand for sport utility vehicles has surged in recent years. And what customers really want are compact models. Buyers can select a diesel engine or two types of gasoline engines. 125 or 155 kilowatts. Our tester takes out the 130 kilowatt diesel model. Four-wheel drive is a standard feature and a front-wheel drive diesel model is in the works. The two-liter TDI Quattro Diesel Q3 takes just over eight seconds to reach 100 kilometers an hour. One option allows drivers to adjust the car's handling and response at the touch of a button. The Audi Drive Select system has four modes to choose from. Efficiency, comfort, auto, and dynamic. Added boasts efficient design thanks to a body in white that weighs just 301 kilos. The hood and tailgate aren't heavyweights either. They're made of aluminum. That means this Q3 model needs just under six liters of diesel to go 100 kilometers. Epler says this model appeals to a range of clientele. Audi is focusing on three target groups, the first one being younger customers under the age of 40, especially men who are single and professionally successful. The next group, couples and families with children younger than 10. And the third group has been dubbed the best agers. They're couples in their 50s who enjoy the high visibility this SUV provides. Audi sees the Q3 as a real crowd pleaser, and the interior reflects that mindset. It's been crafted with an eye to all-around comfort. Quality materials and a clear-cut cockpit design put the focus on practicality, not playfulness. Another practical addition is the metal strip that protects the back of the trunk from taking a beating from heavy cargo. Drivers can increase the trunk space to a volume of nearly 1,400 liters by folding the rear seats forward. That's almost three times the Q3's normal cargo capacity. That leaves one last question, availability. Epler says Europe is the main sales target for the Q3. Germany accounts for almost one-fifth of total sales, making it the top market overall. It's followed by other European countries like Italy, Britain, France and Spain. Russia is also an important market, as is China. The basic diesel model, now in the works, will set the price tag for the Q3 at just under 30,000 euros in Germany. It's Audi's first foray into the compact SUV market. And the Q3 is putting the car maker in competition with BMW, which already makes a compact model, the X1. Peter Geschwantner loves riding motorcycles. But today, he's trading in his two wheels for three. We're testing out the Revaco CT800S, a bike conversion trike. Peter's first impression, 
The chrome design would need a lot of cleaning. He normally races motorcycles, but he's open to trying something new and seeing what the trike can really do. Time to hit the road. In Germany, trike drivers have to wear a helmet, since there's no safety belt. The trike takes some getting used to, particularly because it's wider in the back than in the front. That keeps it from taking the curves like a normal motorbike. But unlike motorcycles, trikes don't require a special license to drive. Anyone licensed to get behind the wheel of a car can take this three-wheeler out for a spin. The trike does cost more than a motorcycle, though, with a basic CT800S listed at about 20,000 euros. Unlike a normal trike, the engine is located under the gas tank, not on the rear axle. This model is based on the Suzuki Intruder motorcycle, with this one featuring an 800cc engine. The front of the wheel has been kept mostly as is. But the back features an axle with two wheels. The frame has also been reworked but there's nothing to suggest that the trike wasn't designed from scratch. The model really shines when it's used by two riders. The back seat is higher than the front, that gives the second rider better visibility than with a motorcycle and better options for holding on. All in all, the trike is a successful concept. But can the Revaco CD800S really win over passionate motorcycle fans like Peter Geschwantner? Yeah. Good. He says the trike is well built, and you don't get the feeling that one of the back wheels is about to fall off. But Peter says it has little to do with motorcycle riding, aside from the basics. The seat's the same, you twist the grip to apply throttle, and your foot to shift gears. He says it's a bit like a four-wheeler, but that he wouldn't trade his motorcycle for a trike. Ultimately, it seems motorbike aficionados will stick with their two wheels. But the trike is a worthy alternative for anyone who normally spends most of their time on the road on four wheels. The new Grand Cabrio Sport is Maserati's latest addition to its lineup. With an output of 331 kilowatts, it boasts more than 7 kilowatts extra performance over the standard model at a top speed of 285 kilometers an hour. All this performance comes at a price, 139,000 euros in Germany, about 6,000 euros more than its more sedate cousin. With its i3 and i8 concepts, BMW previews its upcoming i sub-brand. The Bavarian manufacturer's first series-produced electric automobile, which the car maker hopes will edge out the competition already on the market. Developed for the urban driver, the i3 concept boasts a range of about 150 kilometers and will hit the market in 2013. The dynamic i8 will use a plug-in hybrid and is set to debut in 2014. This is the Mercedes SLK with a facelift. The original snub-nosed front of the Stuttgart Roadster was once the butt of jokes. Now Mercedes has put that behind it, giving the SLK a completely new front. But does the sporty new look live up to its promise? We set it out on the road. We pit the SLK 250 against the BMW Z4 S-Drive 23i and Audi's TT 2.0 TFSI. 
how will it measure up? The iconic Mercedes logo is prominently displayed. The revamped version exudes luxury with generous legroom and a sumptuous interior. That certainly beats the competition, and there's a slew of extras. Even the roof has several options. Car tester Dean Malay found the roof looked less spectacular than he expected. If we want to know what's so special about it, we have to look at it from below. He gives us a view of the panorama roof. It has magic sky control. It means one touch of a button lets the sky in. Sky on, sky off. This magical color-changing roof does cost, Dean admits, around 2,400 euros. This version of the SLK sells in Germany for just over 44,500 euros, equipped with automatic transmission and direct steering. The model focuses more on comfort than sportiness. Despite late shifting, a drive on a country road still seems a bit tame. And the SLK is no friend of high rev numbers, no matter what the specifications say. The 1.8-liter engine produces 150 kilowatts, taking this meteoric motor from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 6.6 .6 seconds. Top speed is 243 kilometers an hour, the fastest of our three contestants. The bottom line is the elegant SLK is a beautiful cruiser. It's fast and economical, but could use a boost in the sportiness department. That's where the Audi steps in. The TT packs a powerful punch. It's a pleasure to rev up, even in normal mode. Pressing its sport button will sharpen the throttle response. The TT is easy to drive, a fun car. The four-cylinder engine produces 155 kilowatts of power, five more than the SLK and the Z4. The sprint from 0 to 100 takes 6.2 seconds. Maximum speed is 242 kilometers per hour. But the fun is over when driving the Audi TT at high speeds. The front wheel drive becomes unpleasantly apparent on bumpy roads. A Quattro would have suited it better. But the roof looks just right. Let's compare. First, the Mercedes. It takes 17 seconds to pack away its roof and that at a very slow pace. The BMW's roof can be stowed away at a speedier 24 kilometers per hour in 18 seconds. The Audi outbids the others on both points. The roof retracts at speeds of 49 kilometers per hour in 10 seconds. As far as the roof is concerned, Tester D. Malay sees the TT as the sure winner. He praises the elegance of the classic fabric roof, and he likes the way it can be folded away swiftly while going at speeds nearing 50 kilometers an hour. In unter 14 unten. Außerdem kann er bis zu 50 km/h fahren, während er die Mütze abnimmt. However, the fabric roof makes it noisy inside the Audi compared with its rival steel constructions. The Audi TT 2.0 TFSI version we tested sells in Germany for about 37,500 euros. The BMW looks like a classic model. The cockpit is tight, but not uncomfortable. The hood is massive. The back is short. The engine is in front with rear wheel drive a textbook roadster. This model has less than expected oomph at high revs, but drivers who shift precisely will be pleased by its excellent response. The heart of this enjoyable roadster is a straight six-cylinder engine, the only one in our three cars. The TT and the SLK are four-cylinder models. The Z4's 2.5-liter engine covers 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 7.3 seconds. A slight extra time compared to the competition is hardly noticeable. And with 150 kilowatts of power, this model swiftly reaches its top speed of 239 kilometers per hour. Our tester calls the TT serious and solid, the SLK exclusive and luxurious. For him, the BMW Z4 is a really sporty, fun model. The driving dynamics of the other models just don't compare. For Dean, that's what counts in a roadster, that it's fun to drive. 
And the Z4 is truly fun to drive. It requires a little more work. It's less easy to handle than the TT, but gives longer lasting pleasure. The BMW Z4 S-Drive 23i version we tested goes for under 38,000 euros in German showrooms. The new SLK with the SLS look doesn't match up to the sportier competition. The TT provides a pleasurable go-kart feeling. The Z4 profits from its six-cylinder configuration and it has plenty of qualities that make it a true driver's car. Despite the new look, the Mercedes' high cost and lack of temperament leave it behind the other roadsters. The Audi TT comes in second. Its front-wheel drive causes problems while taking curves. Our number one is the classic, the BMW Z4. It's the fastest and most spectacular single-make racing series in the world, the Porsche Carrera Cup. Drivers compete in identical Porsche GT3 Cup racers. The model was specially developed for the Porsche racing events. And even if a vehicle does occasionally wipe out, the Porsche Carrera Cup is a professional racing series. Over the years, it's established itself at several European venues in France, Britain and Italy and in Scandinavia. The climax of the season is the German event at the Nürburgring Racing Complex, often called the Green Hell. New participants have to undergo a special training course. Whether they're beginners or professional racers, the drivers have to prove they've taken the seminar. That's unique here. Michel Schratz from the Motorsport Academy Nürburgring explains that the idea is to familiarize drivers with the track. The Nordschleife has some peculiarities that can take some years to master, he says. The trainers try to adapt the driver's talents to the demands of the track, as he puts it. During training, the teams trade in their Porsche Carrera Cup cars for regular road models. Instructors drive ahead to acquaint their pupils with the Nordschleife the world's longest and toughest racing track. Even professional drivers are unused to driving on a track without runoff areas. It's a complicated stretch and dangerous in many spots. The teachers have plenty of tips, especially for wet conditions. He was just, just showing us the first few laps dry line and then wet line and then wet line is very different to dry line in certain places um, where you get a lot of water coming down the track. The back end is, is a little bit loose on this car because it's trying to, trying to put the power down. So uh, yeah, you know, as I'm sure in, uh, in race conditions, if it's like this, it'd be uh, quite an exciting race for sure. Yeah, 100%. This visitor from Britain is fascinated by both track and car. The RS is a very good car. It's, it's um, as I said before, it's uh, the closest you get to a race car feeling for a road car, for, for my opinion. And it's very good on the road as well. So it does both jobs very well, uh, both for the racetrack and for the road. But of course, it depends on tyre choice as well. So if you had uh, Michelin Sport Pilot Cups today, the car would be undrivable uh, in these conditions. But these are Sport Pilots, which have more tread. So uh, it's, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Most of the participants are near professional racers. Many drivers who take part in the GT3 Cup advance in the profession. Some become company drivers, says Michael. For him, this is really high-end racing, the fastest of the Cup events, where drivers need to know what they're doing. The race at the Nürburgring is the greatest challenge for a Porsche Cup driver. They have to master a total of 88 curves on a distance of more than 150 kilometers, over six laps. The current Cup car is based on the Porsche 911 GT3 RS. And for the over 100 participants from 25 countries, it's expertise that counts. Because the rules of the race prescribes identical technology for all the starting vehicles, including the tires. Porsche Carrera World Cup races have also moved beyond the borders of Europe. At venues in Asia, the U.S., and the Middle East, participants come to enjoy the closely fought duels, the hot racing action, and of course, the legendary boxer sound.
The Euromast, trademark of Rotterdam, the Netherlands' second largest metropolis and Europe's largest seaport. A tour bus is an excellent way to see the sights in a city known for its eye-catching avant-garde architecture. Like the remarkable cube houses. And our tour bus today is also quite remarkable. Instead of an ordinary door, a sailor pulls out a gangplank. He's ready to board. So she doesn't know what's uh, what going to happen. No, it's a surprise for her. I think the, the splashing uh, will, will be uh, excited. A city tour of a very special sort. And Henk Skal, who's behind the wheel, is more than an ordinary bus driver. My main function is captain, but I'm also a bus driver, of course. Well, my license for uh, on the water is oh, many years. But when we uh, started with this project, I have to go to back to school to get my license for a bus. The passengers can hardly wait to get underway. This young German couple saw the tour advertised on the internet. They heard it's the thing to do at Rotterdam, but they aren't quite sure what to expect. <laughs> First, Hank takes a quick tour of Rotterdam's sights. It all seems normal so far, but why are there life vests under the seats? In some of the tight turns, Hank does some careful maneuvering. After all, at 22 tons, his bus is a fair bit larger and heavier than an ordinary one. When they arrive at the harbor, he pushes a button to raise the bus and sets the channel to the harbor police. Splash time. The wheels stop working. Instead, turbines propel the bus through the water. The passengers are thrilled. Go into the water, the real splash, it's really, really good, yeah. They all agree that the music definitely heightened the effect. Very exciting, but it's, uh, I think it's lovely. It's, strange experience. The special amphibious bus can move through the water at 15 kilometers an hour. Four different companies cooperated in the patented design. Manager Chris Wilders was one of the developers. This is based on a Volvo. It's a Volvo touring car, 420 horsepower and uh, with aluminum superstructure on it. We made the five exact samples of this bus and we threw it on the road and uh, to learn how the materials act when it falls down. And it was very expensive and uh, because every time the bus falls in its side we thought, oh my god what we're doing now. It's been a long tragic because there are two different sets of rules we have to follow. There's the road, the TUV. There's, of course, on the water, the shipping inspection. And these rules didn't comply always. So we need to find a way to put all those rules in this bus. One of the special rules uh, for, in the, for on the road the registration, we needed the hammers and the stop buttons. It's just normal city stop bus. So it's very funny because people on the water push this button for the next stop. But of course, we don't use it. This thing is the steering of our boat, of the water jets. To go to the right, to go to the left, or backwards. It's just a very easy uh, way to, to steer a boat. The test took five years in all. Now with Captain Hank at the helm, the bus no longer tips to the side, not in the water, nor on the road. Super. The verdict, fantastic. Everyone agrees, an unforgettable experience. 
It's not to be missed, he says. Amsterdam also has a small amphibious bus, a hybrid vehicle with electric batteries, making it especially environmentally friendly. And German cities have also expressed interest in the amphibious bus. So maybe soon, Splash Time will open at a city near you. Coming soon on Drive It, a cult car for the next generation, the new Volkswagen Beetle. And a lot of convertible for the price. The Dacia Logan MCV takes on the Lada Priora.